living in the tangible substance of the shadow. Now that sounds a little bit uh, of a weird title, but I think it's going to be powerful. It's going to impact your life in a great way. In the Old Testament, we had a lot of shadows, and we know that the law points to shadows. And we're going to look at some passages that talks about that. It says in Colossians 2.16, uh, Therefore, suffer no one to sit in judgment on you as to eating or drinking or to regards to festival or new moon or Sabbaths. These were a shadow of that which was soon to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Now, uh, what it says here is clear, that the substance, the real thing, is actually of Christ, wherein all these things, the new moons and the Sabbaths and the uh, eatings and washings and the washings of your hands before you ate and all those things, were just a, sh a shadow of the real thing. And if you read the passage here in uh, Colossians 2, 16 and 17 and, and look a little bit of or into the historic background and what was going on there, it was actually uh, a big problem because the Gentiles didn't have any written documents that they could refer to as pertaining to what God says. We need to understand that they were excluded from most of them were excluded from the reading of the law or they had nothing to do with the Torah. It was, there was a, in certain cases that the Gentiles could hear a little bit of it, but that's not the practice. That was not what they were busy with. They were believing in all their false gods and they had their idols and everything. And then the Jews had their own God, which they said was superior to all the other gods which these people just thought was absolute rubbish. Now, the gospel was then preached in different uh, cities where these Gentile people were. Then they started to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. And when they believed that Christ was raised from the dead and that he was also their Messiah, and not just the Messiah of the Jew, but that he was the Savior of the world, they received the Holy Spirit. And supernatural things started to take place. They started to pray in tongues. They had the power of the Holy Spirit. They, it, it looked exactly the way it looked when the Jews received the Holy Spirit. But the difference was this. The Jews were sitting with the Bible. They had the whole Old Testament and the prophets uh, uh, the Psalms, they had all of that. They had the Torah, they, they had the writings. They've got, they have a, a rich history of God encountering with them as well as then all the, the shadows pointing to the substance which was Christ. What then happened for about, and it was a shock for me when I found that out, for about, I mean, when Paul went up to Jerusalem, in Acts 15. This was about 20, 25 years after the church in Jerusalem received Jesus for the first time or after the resurrection. We sit about in 50, 55 AD, we sit with the, the church in Galatia, uh, the, the, the letter to, Gal to the Galatians, and we pick up that Paul says that I went to Jerusalem. This was, like I said, about 50, 30, 30, sorry, 20 years, 25 years after Jesus' resurrection. And when they came there, the church in Jerusalem were still following all of the customs of Moses. They were under the law. They were following all the Sabbath rules. They were going to the temple, following all the feasts, circumcising their children, continuing like they've always continued, and then going and preaching the gospel that Jesus is the Messiah and people are getting saved. Now what happens now is we find people in, Col the, in Colossa, they're getting saved. And now when the Jews come and speak to them, what would they think? They would think, well, these Jews know better. In the meantime, uh, most of them didn't know better. They still knew the law. And then they brought the law system into the churches, 
in the Gentile cities and towns and they felt that they were now brought under or they were actually brought under uh, the judgment of someone else and this was the church. This was the church. In many instances it was the church and in Galatia it was actually people sent from James and that is a big problem and here Paul comes and he says listen all these things are shadows so we can now see that Paul comes and he sits with this thing of there was a time of shadows and now there is a time of substance but we find a, a, a time where it overflows into the into the other now uh, let us look at the substance mentioned in Hebrews 5 here or Hebrews 8 verse 5 it says here in Hebrews 8 verse 4 for if he were on earth he should not be a priest seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law who serves now this is the gifts according to the law who serves unto an example and a shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to take to make the tabernacle for see says he that you make all things according to the pattern showed to you in the mountain. So we see here that the tabernacle, everything inside the tabernacle, the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, the most holy place, which was a square or a cube, uh, or which was a cube, the, uh, the, I mean everything there was a shadow of something true and something real and he says to him here make everything according to the pattern that I've shown you on the mountain why because this pattern is a shadow of something that is true and real in the heavens now we have seen it this way and we, we looked at it this way that um, that there is a real physical temple in heaven and now this physical temple on the earth is just a type and a shadow of the more the temple that is flooded with more splendor and all those kind of things and there's some kind of a temple in heaven and now this is a type and a shadow of that temple now i've got news for you there is no uh build it, a temple building in heaven at all let me give you an example of what i'm talking about if we look at the new Jerusalem that comes from heaven, we read uh, Revelation 21, we will see that the city is square. And for the Jew that would read that, that understands the old and that has been enlightened, now I want to say this to you, if you know the law and you know types and, sh types and shadows, or if you, if you know the temple, it doesn't mean you understand what it is all about. And we're still going to get a little bit into that. And um, we're going to see that many of those people didn't know what it was. It was actually a time of great confusion, a time of terror when you live in the shadow and you think it is the substance and you don't know it's a shadow of something. So uh, there was hints to that like we would see here uh, quoted in Hebrews 5. But the point that I'm trying to make is that if we look at Jerusalem, the city Jerusalem, it was a cube. And the most holy place was also a cube and what does that mean that means that this city is actually the most holy place but we know that the city that comes from heaven jerusalem is not a city it is the very people of god it is the believer it is the believer and inside that city there is no temple why because the lamb and god is the temple and even in that city there is no sun and moon why because God has glorified man how with the light of life which is immortality so what it's actually saying is that that most holy place cube in the uh, uh, temple and also in the tabernacle was simply meaning one thing that spoke of in the end an immortal human being sitting in equality with God, fellowshipping with God. When we look at what Moses saw on the mountain, what did he see? He, he saw that the Lord said, I am the Lord, the Lord God. 
I am merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. And according to that pattern of the person of God, God gave him instruction to build a tabernacle and a temple and all those kind of things, which would be a type and a shadow of his very goodness. That is what it talks about and nothing else. The substance is the very person of God. That is what it is. It's God himself and his relationship with man. Um, <clears throat> it says here in Hebrews 9.28, and I'm going to use another, the two other shadows of the old, and then we're going to move over into the new and get into what I want to say about Mother's Day and relationships and the, 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 the church and the Lord and so forth. It says here in Hebrews 9.28, So Christ was once offered to, be, uh, to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear a second time without sin unto salvation. So that is beautiful. It says he will appear a second time and then in that second appearing he will save us and he will appear without sin. What is the appearance without sin? It's the appearance without the weakness in the flesh. For those of you that follow this, this, uh, these messages regularly, you will remember that we in Romans 5 verse 8 and 9 we have established that sin is actually the weakness or the inability of the flesh to have the immortal, eternal life of God by the works of the law. Now it says that Jesus will appear a second time. How will he appear? He will not appear in mortal flesh as what he appeared the first time, but he will appear in immortal yet physical human flesh and then he will save us from our mortal flesh. That's what he's talking about there. Um, he will appear a second time. It says here, so Christ, verse 28 again, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear a second time without sin unto salvation, for the law having a shadow of the good things to come. So what is the law? The law is the shadow of what? Of the very good things to come. So if you read the law, if you read any Old Testament passage, even the passage that I've referred to now in Jeremiah there, from verse chapter 25 right up to 29, 11, and even down to 14, that when you read all of that, you have to read it from the perspective of seeing the good things to come, which is Christ, or you are not reading the law correctly. Here it says that, for the law having a shadow of the good things to come. So we can find no substance in that shadow. It is only a shadow of the good things to come. And not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Now, um, <coughs> That you might say, but what does this have to do with Mother's Day? What does this have to do with, uh, with a mom in the house? Now, I've got a word for you, and I don't want to jump the gun, but I want to say to you that your wife that, that has bare children for you, your mom, there's a certain type and shadow. There's something that she's a type and a shadow of. And as we start to see that and realize that, as Adam realized that in the beginning, and we start to see that, it just brings what Christ has done closer to home. <laughs> Amen. Uh, if we think of the people in the old covenant, they never thought that, their, that what they were doing, the temple that they were building, was a shadow of anything. They thought it was a substance. They didn't treat the slaughtering of a lamb as saying, this speaks of God uh, taking me out of the bondage of Egypt, wherein I am actually, and what it actually talks about is, that God will deliver me from mortality and sin in the flesh and break the yoke of uh, condemnation and death off my back and so give me a hopeful future of immortality because of a man that will carry my sin and die. They never thought 
that that lamb spoke about the lamb God would give. They thought they bring a lamb. In the meantime, it was a type and a shadow of God providing the lamb. They never thought that they could actually never bring the lamb God wants, but that it was actually something God would bring. They could never see that. So they lived in the shallowness of applying and living in the shadow without having understanding. And they made, uh, they, they made a substance out of the shadow, not knowing actually what they are doing. Imagine how empty Sabbath, day, Sabbath days would have been. And we can see the emptiness of that when Jesus was on the earth. Jesus would heal someone on the Sabbath day. He would know that, this, uh, um, that man doesn't belong to the Sabbath, but Sabbath to the man, and the same with the temple and all those kind of things. And he would heal. He would have understanding on what the rest of God means. God um, bringing rest to his people or manifesting his kingdom for his conquering the enemies, he, for his conquered the enemy. They, they don't understand rest. They don't understand what the Sabbath means. That's why on the Sabbath they would live in the emptiness of judging even Jesus, saying to them, saying to Jesus, why are you telling somebody to carry his bed? Do you see how empty that is? But we who understand what the Sabbath rest means, and sadly in the church not even many do understand that. We that understand the Sabbath rest, we that understand uh, the Sabbath in the light of Isaiah 40, where it says, go and tell your people the war is over, you can now rest. Sabbath talks about a king who is at the end of his war, wherein he is now establishing his kingdom because he has now conquered. It doesn't talk about him not doing anything anymore. It talks about his resting from war. He is sitting down in his throne and now his rulership is now being established in the world as what God has now uh, entered in. And, and we shall, and we are already experiencing the first fruits of that rest and we will enter into that rest as well uh, in our immortal bodies. And there's a lot to say about that in Hebrews, which I'm not going to get into. But we can imagine the emptiness you would have to live in if you don't know what that pillar of fire is a day. If you think it only means heating me, uh, you, you don't understand what that those four or five or five pillars at the veil means. You don't know what the veil means. You know nothing of that. You just live and think that's the substance, and you are judgmental about that, and it's powerless towards you. Imagine you could. Uh, the people of the old, <clears throat> that they could have known what that would mean in the future. If they could know what that would mean in the future, I think you will, there will be more power in how they would have treated the substance and, uh, uh, sorry, there would have been more power in how they would have treated the shadow. And once the substance has come, they would have nothing to do anymore with a shadow because now they have received their blessed hope. And that's what we are in, in the New Testament, in certain areas of our lives. I want to just, before we go to the, to the new, I want to just show to you the power of just another type and shadow of the old. <clears throat> in Mesopotamia, what they would do is, there was something that was called the Mesopotamian animation of idols. And, or of the gods. And what they would do is they would take uh, artists and craftsmen that are of the best, and then they would go and of the finest, best materials, they would make an idol, either out of wood or out of stone, overlay it with gold and silver and put in beautiful stones and decorate it so beautifully. Take a lot of time and make it very beautiful. And then they knew that this thing was actually dead. But what they wanted is, they wanted their God with them. And then they, had, then they went through a ritual wherein, and that ritual would be the animation, or the bringing to life, or the, where they can actually say, a God was given to us uh, of this idol. 
And what they would do is they would take this idol and carry it away to what was called a, a sacred garden. And in this sacred garden, they would lay down this idol. And then they would leave the idol there overnight. Then the next morning, what they would come and do is they would believe that this idol was then now birthed unto life. They will take water, wash out its mouth, like you would take the saliva from a baby's mouth when the baby is born, and clean out the eyes. They'll wash out the mouth, wash out the eyes, and then carry this idol and put this idol in the temple and say, Behold, this is our God. This is then the image or the living God amongst us. That's what they would believe. And then ceremonially, and this is gross, but this is what they did, they would take the, the craftsmen and cut off their hands in a ceremony and they would take all the utensils that this thing was made with, put it inside a sheep, throw it into the river and have it washed down the sacred river that was next to the temple. And now you find the writer of Genesis comes and he writes a beautiful, wonderful, not children's story, but a powerful theological critique against these uh, Mesopotamian way of thinking about the gods. And he writes and says, no, look at our God, what he has done. And now he's actually talking about the shadow of Jesus to us again. And he's saying, you guys know that you're not supposed, it's not for man to make God. That's why that's your ritual where you cut off your hands and so forth. But let me tell you what actually happened. I want you to wake up. I want you to see what we believe and what the truth is. God came and he made an idol. And this idol was put in a garden. And that is what the word image means. If you go and study the word image, that we are the image of God. Uh, it actually means idol. God crafted a man from the dust of the earth. And then he blew into him the breath of life inside this, may I say, sacred garden. And then he let him stand up. And he's actually saying, you are the very image of God in the earth. That is what we can see the, the writer of Genesis has got just a little bit of a hold on substance here. And we sit with a writing that influenced our lives greatly. So how much more today? Now I want to say this, I'm not saying that we are idols in the sense of we must pray to one another. No, you are the idol of God. Jesus is the idol of God. Put inside the temple of God from where God rules and reigns. We need to see that. Amen. Sadly, we use the book of Genesis uh, chapter 1 to try and determine how old the earth is instead of seeing who we are and seeing that that first Adam was actually just a type of the one that was to come. And even the whole Genesis story is also just a narrative and a story of what is truly to happen and how creation takes place in the resurrection. True creation, the one God had in mind, didn't take place in Genesis. True creation, the one that God has in mind, took place the day Jesus was raised from the dead. And now, from that truth we are experiencing the very life of God as we believe upon that and we will find how God fully matures and manifests this in us. Now we get to what I want to say for today and I think we have to have a solid foundation to see the power of all of this because as I'm talking, as I'm saying this and this is the reason why I do this, this is why I use so many different examples is as you see the shadow and you see the substance, what happens to your heart? Wow! Beautiful! Wonderful! Hallelujah! That's what takes place in your heart. Now, we're going to look at some shadows that the church still has today ordained by God. But we're going to look at that shadow from the perspective of the substance, and then we're going to find how we can treat this shadow with so much more respect and from the platform of understanding. It says here in Ephesians 5 from verse 20 to, uh, from verse 22 to 32, it talks about marriage. 
And I'm going to read it. It's about 10 verses. I'm going to just read it to you. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Can you see how he comes here with, with, with Christ now? And he says that Christ is the head of the church. So he talks about a shadow here, and he also talks about a substance. So the moment we start to see the family in the light of the substance, and we actually draw our power and our truth from the substance, then we can, while we are at a place of imperfection as pertaining to our mortality and our lack of seeing the fullness of what God has done, having the hope of the return of Christ, what will we do? We love on one another. We see that we can now like the communion. I should have uh, left the communion here, uh, but... If you think of that bread and if you think of that wine, to take that bread, I mean, it is something physical, something that you can touch, the wine that you drink, it's something, and I mean, it is dead, basically. That bread is dead, that wine is dead. But what gives it power is what you connect it to. Now, in the very same way as what, and this is how, when I use communion, I don't know if it's like that for you, but when I use it, when I take that bread and I immediately think of the body of Christ and I think of him saying, this is my body. I know that that bread is not supernaturally changed into the body of Jesus, but all of a sudden there is something much closer when I think of that bread now being broken and I'm saying, this is the body of Jesus. It is still a type and a shadow, but all of a sudden there's something sacred to me about that, something holy about that, and there is a power that flows from that realization because what is spiritual uh, comes, and or let me put this, what is unseen comes into the scene now, and we can enjoy that and be empowered by that powerful reminder. In the very same way, Paul comes now, and he is saying um, a husband and wife relationship is like that. So now when you husband and wife see one another and deal with one another, all of a sudden it is as you are holding your wife, you are actually saying this is how the Lord Jesus is holding me. Or the wife, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the husband and wife can, can do that and you can feel as you love on your wife and you hold her because you love her, you feel what Jesus feels towards you as the husband for in our relationship with Christ, we are the wife. And now the wife feels protected and safe and loved on. And then she can feel that is how the Lord feels about me. Amen. And as a husband sees that his wife uh, submits unto him in certain things as he exercises love towards her and protection and provision and so forth. What is he seeing? He's immediately seeing that I am treating, this is how the Lord provides for me. This is how good he is for me. And I mean, we can just see so many of these things. And we can read on. It says, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ has loved the church and gave himself for it. That, it might sanctif that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So what he's saying here is, as you care for your wife, it is actually pointing to how, a shadow of how Christ with his words evoke your beauty and bring life to you. Amen. It goes on to Ephesians uh, 5.32. It says, But this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And then it actually says here, let me read verse 31 and explain to you how this mystery works. It says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and he shall be joined unto his wife, for the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. Now, why was the great mystery to Paul? It was a mystery because in the Semitic culture, uh, in the Semitic tribal system, tribal world logic that they lived in, 
what they did was the wife never left, or the husband never left father and mother and was cleaved unto the wife. No, the wife left her father and mother and then joined the clan of, or the group that had a patriarch leading it, joined that tribe. That is how it worked. You would find Abraham, if, if Abraham had children and their children, the his sons married, then the wife left that group and came to them. And they had, I mean, they lived in these, what we would call and look in Africa, that they had these villages that they lived in. And that's how they lived. They had a wall around it, protected, safe. And that, I mean, I don't want to get into much detail there, but that's how it worked. But when we see, even in Genesis, we find the critique that was written uh, unto Mesopotamian or what we would call Babylonian thinking that was still having its residue in the Israelites that was in the desert, we find that it is said, listen, the way God deals is a bit different. And to them it was always a mystery. What would this mystery be? The mystery is actually what God was saying from the beginning is the son would leave father and mother, God the Father and the Holy Spirit, not that you can leave them, but we see the typology here, and come and cling to his wife and be one flesh with her, become physical and immortal, and then bring also with him the power of what he had in that family and join it to this family, and so have this whole family permeate with a life that is inside him. And Paul comes and talks about this, this is a mystery. I believe to the Jewish people this must have been a mystery. He says, and I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now it comes to mothers. <clears throat> what stood out for me when I was thinking about this and when I think of this message, Eliana said to me, Bertie, for Mother's Day, um, I want you to minister a message on the Holy Spirit. And... Uh, could you share a little bit about that? Now, we've had our Mother's Day service in Durbanville a week ago already because we alternate between preaching in Durbanville and in Malmesbury. So every second week I'm here and the other week I'm in, in Durbanville. But we wanted to have this. And she said, let us just bless the ladies, preach on the Holy Spirit and how this connects. And I started to study this out and, and look more into this. And as I went to Genesis 3, <clears throat> verse 20, this is what it says. And Adam called his, called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. Now with everything that I've said, and when we're looking at types and shadows here, and we're looking now at the shadow wherein we understand the substance, which is family and church and marriage, that is not a shadow anymore <clears throat> like the Old Testament shadow where we live in the blindness of not seeing what it's all about, now in family, we can treat this shadow in a much great, with much greater respect and we can actually treat it with understanding because we understand what this is all about. Now with that in mind, we're going to look just at mother, the mom. And this is especially for the moms today. It says, And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she is the mother of all the living. In Hebrew, it is Shavah which means life or living. That's what it is in the Hebrew. And now, if you go and read the Septuagint, which is the Greek Old Testament, this is the Greek word for Eve, zoe. That's what it means, zoe or life. So with that in mind, we think of scriptures like Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am, and the words that I speak, or the words that he speaks, is life and it is truth. And he will give us eternal life. That, it is not a, that he has conquered death and that the, li the, the light of life has come and shone now towards us. That is what we have in mind. So I believe that when I look at Helena and when I look at my children and think of the fact that she gave birth, I think of the very Zoe of God, the very life of God right there 
wherein He saves me unto life. That is what it is. He's come to give me Zoe, and Zoe in abundance, that immortality. So here we can see God with, and we all also through our moms, we understand the whole process. When I look at Eliana and I think of her being the mother of the three living boys that I'm having, I see how everything worked. She gave birth to them. She raised them. She cares for them. She loves them. She is the type and the shadow of the very spirit of life of God in our house. So when she's sitting there, she's working that computer right now, when I see her there and I think of her there, what am I thinking of? I see a physical person in front of me, which is now a shadow, which I can feel and touch and handle and embrace of the very Spirit of God, which is called Zoe. Now, Eve was called Zoe because she was the mother of all the living, but she is also a type and a shadow of the church and a type and a shadow of Christ and us and a type and a shadow of, I believe, the very Spirit of God Himself, the very core of life, that through which everything takes place in our lives, where we are born from God, where we're not just born as babies and then left to ourselves, but where that very Spirit comes and feeds that baby and cares for that baby, uh, prepares food, loves, dresses, cares, raise them up in the house, teach them the customs of the house. Uh, the, the, the mom is the very spirit of a house. It is, she is the very spirit of a home. That is, she's that warmth. A father can provide a house, but a mom makes it a home. A father can give the food, but a mom brings the meal. She is the life of that house. And now, when we look at our wives that has children, or when we look at our moms, what do we see? If you take your mom and you give her a hug, maybe your mom, like in my case, has already passed away. If I hug Helena, what do I do when I hug her? When I hold her, I am thinking of the, the closeness of the very life of God. I can behold and think and touch, like in the communion, the very substance. Um, it, 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 it's a physicality. There's a physicality around the truth here. And that is, when I hold her, when I see her, when I hold her hand, what do I think? What is in my mind? I am seeing the Spirit of God how He gives birth to, of life to me, how He brings life to our house, how it is a process, how He brings or she brings it forth and gives life to us. Glory to God. And what I want um, in ending the service, what I want you to do today, maybe you're watching this later, uh, maybe you're not in the live webcast here, but this is a special day and I would want, <clears throat> I know we did, do the communion before the service and I want to do it at the end but people slot in so late they're going to miss 15 minutes of the message <laughs> in the live if I do the communion at the end but the idea is take communion again and can the husband and the children there present go to your mom and or uh, yeah, go to your mom and just take that bread and take that wine and serve them with it and just speak and declare this beauty and this gratitude that, that you have in, in your heart towards her for what she's meant to you but then also do it from the perspective of as close as what she is as what you can touch her right there and hold her right there that is the closeness and the reality and the truth of the Holy Spirit, the very life of God towards all of us. Glory to God. Father, I want to come today and I want to thank you, Lord, that you have come and, you, and just through 
mothers and the, the, the shadow that there is and the type that there is in what we see in our mothers, we can see your closeness. And we want to declare the value that they have for us, but even now more so in that we can see and touch and handle and from understanding also deal and treat this shadow of the truth. Thank you, Lord, that mothers can also know that as a mom, she's just a shadow of the truth and that she can never live in guilt or condemnation thinking that she is the substance which must actually do the work of the Spirit. But that she can only love with a love that's in her heart that's born from you, and that is it. Thank you, Lord, that every mom today and every child today can look at their mom and the mom look at herself never thinking that eternal life flows from the mom, putting them under a pressure and uh, uh, putting expectations that's not supposed to be there on themselves or, or on their moms, but where they can just say, we are all beholding the glory of God. Father, if we think of the Holy Spirit, we are thinking of Jesus being raised from the dead where he was vindicated, when he was declared as the Son of God with power and authority, without sin, conquering death, raised by the Spirit. We are thinking of the Zoe, the very life of God that was given to us when the Holy Spirit was poured out. For the Spirit is called the Spirit of Life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The pneuma, the breath of life. It doesn't help we have breath, but we don't have life. And thank you, Lord, that you have come to give us that life. And in our moms, we see this truth. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. I want to thank all of you for watching this. And I trust this message has been an eye-opener to you as unto the power of seeing the finished work of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us, the power of the resurrection and how close it is to us and how God comes and how it doesn't speak from out there between the clouds, but how he's got a language that is much deeper than just written words, wherein he comes and speaks inside the parameters of our very being, our family and how we relate to one another. So many times we want to hear the voice of God in such a difficult way, but it's right in front of us. Glory to God. I want to say to all the mothers, you are special, you are loved. Thank you for who you are. And we look at you in a completely different way. And it's beautiful unto us. Amen. Guys, thank you so much for watching. And then I will see you again next week. God bless.